very grateful for the opportunity to speak about one of the five solos in the week before Reformation Sunday, not least because the question that I've been pursuing for most of my adult life, what does it mean to be biblical, presupposes sola scriptura, the supreme authority of the Bible for Christian faith, life, and doctrine. Earlier this semester, I encouraged my scripture and theology class not to confuse sola scriptura with solo scriptura. The Bible is not our only resource, either in life or theology. There are many things we need to know, but it is the supreme and singular authoritative source, the rule that rules all other rules, because the Bible is the only book which has God as its author. When we say scripture alone, then, we're not saying that we're going to forego extra biblical knowledge or that we don't need information from other sources or academic departments. We're rather saying that we don't need any more words from God. These are sufficient. Scripture alone is an authoritative and sufficient rule for discerning the word and will and wisdom of God. What else do I need to say? Just this, it's not enough to profess sola scriptura, we have to do it. Sola scriptura ultimately names the practice of biblical authority in the church. But in practice, the church is too often guided by other texts, texts that talk about therapeutic techniques, marketing strategies, financial plans, self-help, and other books that belong to what we might call our canon outside the canon. <laughs> David Wells, the weeping prophet of evangelicalism, <laughs> has for years lamented the tendency of evangelicals to exchange their birthright, sola scriptura, for a mess of pottage, sola cultura. Eugene Peterson makes a similar point. He says it's not enough to have a high view of scripture or even to read the Bible regularly. We have to read it formatively. That is, in such a way that it shapes our view of truth, our way of life. And Peterson's metaphor for this deep participatory, participatory method of reading is ingesting. To practice sola scriptura is to eat this book. Or perhaps we could say it is to eat, pray, and love these words. Some of you may know the philosopher J.L. Austin. He believed in the wisdom of analyzing the way we use ordinary language. And in one of his essays, he tries to get a better conceptual handle on the notion of responsibility by listening very carefully to the way we make excuses. And he's particularly interested in the different words we use when we're trying to evade responsibility for doing something accidentally unintentionally, undeliberately. And these are, to use the title of his essay, Three Ways of Spilling Ink. Well, like Austin, I'm interested in the words the Bible uses to describe the ways in which we're to practice sola scriptura. Three ways of following God's word. Three ways of eating the book. Three ways of swilling biblical ink. Each of the passages read this morning describes a practice of biblical authority. But before we turn to consider them, it might be helpful to remember that scripture isn't an end to itself, but a means to Jesus Christ. Sola Scriptura serves solus Christus. And if the Bible is above all earthly powers as it is, it's because it's the commission testimony of the one who rules over all. So the written word serves the living word, Jesus Christ, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to talk about scripture in relation to Christ's being the way, the truth, and the life. I'll suggest that scripture is uh, what lights our way, orients us to the truth, and indwells us with the life of Jesus Christ. So let's turn to the first way I propose that we should sing sola. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. And it's fitting that we begin with a psalm, and Psalm 19 in particular. Psalm 1 represents the whole Psalter's celebration of God's Torah, or instruction, given at Sinai. 
And we need this instruction in order to walk rightly, which is to say righteously. The book of Psalms is a whole curriculum in itself for learning how to sing sola. Psalm 119 uses eight different terms for the word of God, including in the English translation, statutes, commands, percepts, seems to be law heavy. And maybe that's the reason why Bonhoeffer was told in seminary that it's the most boring of the Psalms. But what's striking is the way that it moves from Torah to the joy God's law brings when we meditate on it. Sinking our teeth into God's word brings satisfaction and wisdom. How sweet are your words to my taste. And that was Bonhoeffer's experience too. Despite what he had been taught in seminary, when he was in a Nazi prison, he found out that it was the hardiest psalm of all. And he relished the times that he could sit and meditate on it. The word of God is a light to our path. It shows us the path we should follow, the way we should live. And if we ignore this light, the light that streams from God's word, we'll have to make our way in darkness. As Calvin comments, the whole of our lives will be enveloped in obscurity so that we can't do anything else than wander miserably from the right way. By contrast, the one who attends to the law of God will find, says Calvin, an unerring light. Scripture is a reliable guide to knowing God and to cultivating godliness. And I think the Bible is a light unto our academic path as well. St. Bonaventure's 13th century treatise on the reduction of arts to theology ought to be required reading for every Wheaton student, grad and undergrad alike. Its thesis is clear, concise, and compelling. He says, all forms of human knowledge and the human mind itself serves one overarching purpose, namely to lead us back to God. That's the sense of reduction. I'm not a reductionist, but in this sense, reduction simply means leading back. And Bonaventure begins his reflection on reducing the arts to theology, leading them back to theology, well, with a reflection on James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Bonaventure calls knowledge gained through the senses and reasons respectively the inferior and interior lights. But scripture he calls the superior light. As I say, it's a book well worth reading. He compares the six branches of knowledge to the six days of Genesis. And the Bible, he says, corresponds to the first day of creation when God created light. And all the secular arts and sciences are seen for what they are only in the light of Scripture. So his conclusion, the light given on the first day is necessary for walking the rest of the week. We see a similar image in the New Testament in the context of Peter appealing to his experience of Jesus' transfiguration as a proof that he has not been following cleverly devised myths. Jesus, of course, claimed to be the light. And at the transfiguration, Peter saw that happen. Jesus' face shone like the sun. The Greek for shone is lampo. And even his clothes became white as light. Peter mentions the divine voice that attests Jesus as the beloved son. And then he says, we have the word of prophecy made more sure to which we do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. So God is light. God creates light. Jesus is light. Light shines from Jesus' face. And the word of God is also caught up in this economy of divine light. Luke 24, 27 suggests a second way of singing sola. If Psalm 119 highlights the law, Jesus' discussion with his disciples on the way to Emmaus highlights the prophets and all the scriptures. There are many kinds of writing in the Bible, but according to Jesus, all, the law, prophecies, psalm, apocalyptic, wisdom, all are ultimately about 
concern or refer to him. To live as a disciple is to walk in his way. So the Bible in all its literary diversity is a lamp that illumines our way, yet the image that comes to mind in Luke 24 is that rather of a canonical atlas. The Bible, yes, has many different kinds of literary forms. We can liken these to maps. And each of these lights our way, maps our way, provides a kind of guidance. But in order to read a map rightly, you not only have to understand the legend and the scale and so on, but in order to get from here to there, from incomprehension to understanding, you have to be able to relate the map to reality. You have to know where true north is to use the map correctly. We see that the ancient Israelites had the maps. They had the scriptures. They had the law. But the tragedy of Israel's history was that though they had the maps, they didn't know how to relate them to reality. They didn't know how to follow them properly to their correct destination. Listen to Jesus' rebuke of the map reading skills of the Pharisees in John 5, 39. You diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse, you, you refuse to come to me to have life. I think that's a sobering lesson for us all. We're not saved simply because we have a high view of the Bible or because we can read it in the original languages. I dare say the Pharisees of Jesus' day had a high view of the Bible and could diagram sentences well. But what good is a high view of a map if you're disoriented? If you aren't sure how the map relates to the real world, you can't read it. If you can't determine where you are on this map. But the Bible's orienting function is unique. Wherever we happen to be, Whoever we are, whatever we happen to be doing, it points us consistently in the same direction, not to the magnetic north, but to the Christian's north star, Jesus Christ. He's the beginning, the middle, and the end of all God's ways. The scriptures are therefore not a random collection of documents, a random collection of maps, but together they comprise a canonical compass and to be a Christian is to know how to follow these maps in such a way that your walk is consistently directed in the direction of Jesus Christ. So that's the second way of singing sola, by letting scripture orient you to the truth. So scripture lights our way, orients us to the truth, and then finally, thinking of Colossians 3.16, indwells our life together in Christ. Let the word of God, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, says Paul. He's describing the new life that should characterize those that are walking the way of truth in Christ. He says the peace of Christ rules and the word of Christ dwells in the hearts of those who belong to the community of the faithful. Because today marks the first day of the World Series, I should perhaps point out that Paul uses an athletic image in Colossians 3, the idea of Christ's peace ruling, the references to the ruling of an umpire. The peace of Christ then acts as a kind of umpire in our hearts, ruling out desires that threaten the peace of the community. Let the word of God, Christ dwell in you richly. Word of Christ. We could read this two ways. It could be the word that Christ speaks or the word that speaks Christ. But as we saw in Luke 24, all the scriptures are ultimately about Christ anyway. So we can take the phrase broadly to refer to biblical discourse in general or narrowly to refer to the gospel in particular. But the real question is, how does discourse dwell in us richly? In grad school, we tend to focus quite a bit on the head. We have ways of finding out what you've got in there or not. But, and one way that words dwell in us is memorization. And Paul doesn't exactly locate the dwelling place he has in mind of the word of Christ, 
But I think it's clear from the context that he's concerned that we not be not hearers only, but that we be doers or even assimilators of this word. Psalm 37, 31 says of the righteous one that the law of his God is in his heart. In his heart, his steps do not slip. Here's a Eugene Peterson's inimitable translation of Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. I also like Lightfoot's suggestion that the expression stands for the presence of Christ in the heart as an inward monitor. Some read Paul as personifying the word of Christ, saying that the word is to dwell among us as a fellow member of our community. I think it's more likely, however, that Paul is appealing to each person individually and to the church corporately to let the word of Christ indwell us not dwell next to us, but indwell us. Because he uses the same verb, enoikeo, in 2 Corinthians 6.16, in connection with the church being the temple of the living God. And Paul cites in that context, God's statement in Leviticus 26.11, I will make my dwelling among you. And he also uses the same term, enoikeo, in Romans 8.11, to speak of the spirits, indwelling us. The general idea is that God's word and wisdom takes possession of us as the spirit progressively conforms us to Christ and the Christ likeness by ministering the word of Christ to our innermost being. Practicing sola scriptura at the limit means sanctification. Paul doesn't want us simply to lock up the word of Christ in our minds. We're to build up the church by ministering, expressing that word to one another, not least by psalms and hymns and spiritual songs as we were doing at the beginning of the service. We offer the word that God sent to us via the prophets and psalmists back to God. And so the word of God dwells in us riches, richly, not least by leading our worship. So, practicing sola scriptura means adopting the Bible, God's word written, as the church's principal rule for action, understanding, and life. Scripture alone is above all earthly powers because scripture alone is the God-given means that lights our way, orients us to the truth, and indwells our common life in Christ. And we need to recover all three ways of singing sola if we're not only to teach divine wisdom, but catch it. And a final thought, Sola Scriptura does not exclude, but calls for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit, the Spirit typically works in conjunction with the Word. As Christ is the content of Scripture, so spirituality is a matter of the Spirit's ministering that Word to our hearts. That's how we become conformed to Christ. So the practice of sola scriptura ultimately depends on solus spiritus. And it's particularly in worship that we grant God's word and spirit the preeminent place, for worship is the crucible where word and spirit alike shape our souls uh, and not simply our theological systems. It's in worship that we get caught up in the rhythm of the word so that the biblical words, the way the biblical words go, become the way we go. To let scripture light your way, orient you to the truth, and reside inside you means letting the divine author have an authoritative say in everything we're doing. So a scriptura means that the Bible's vision of God making all things new in Christ through the spirit is the plumb line according to which all our attempts to reach truth, goodness, and beauty have to measure up. May we all be part of that great church choir that sings psalms and the law and the prophets and even epistles to one another in all wisdom. May we all learn to sing the scriptures, celebrating them in our hearts as well as our heads, singing this sola for the sake of the ultimate sola, 
Sola Dei Gloria.